Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, we have a very special speaker who will discuss grief when your pet dies or when you anticipate the death of your pet. Uh, Sandra Grossman is the co-founder of Pet Loss Partners, a certified pet loss specialist and a compassion fatigue educator. After 20 years in the business sector, she changed careers to pet loss support after healing from the loss of her beloved Siamese cat, Maz, to lymphoma. She currently supports both pet parents who are anticipating a loss and those who have lost a beloved pet by offering virtual pet loss support groups as well as individual sessions, either by telephone or Zoom. Sandra works with veterinary and animal care professionals too, helping them manage compassion fatigue and create an individualized self-care plan. She also helps veterinary practices create a compassionate practice in their hospitals to better support their patients, clients, and staff. She is the author of the End of Life Pet Loss Study and often speaks at conferences, sharing the study's findings and the core principles of a compassionate practice. We're going to stop after about 25 minutes and take a few questions, then we'll continue and the rest will be at the end. Uh, so I hope you'll stick with us through the whole thing. Um, I also want to mention donations. The uh, webinars and the other free services that we have are all supported through your donations. So if you are inclined either during or after the webinar, you can go to our homepage at yourdogsfriend.org. And in the right hand upper corner, you will see an icon for donations. Um, I, like many of you, have lost pets before, and I'm looking forward to what Sandra has to say. So, Sandra, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Deborah. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I actually have really been looking forward to getting a chance to come here and sharing this information. Helping pet parents who are struggling with anticipatory grief and pet loss it really is my passion and my life's work. Uh, my plan for our webinar today is to first start out talking about anticipatory grief. And then, as Deborah said, we'll take some questions. And then we'll go on to actually talking about pet loss and some coping strategies. And we'll have more time for questions at the end. I will let you know that I'm going to be sharing a lot of information today. My hope for you and my suggestion is that you look for two or three things that can really help you, pointers that can help you in whatever situation you're in now. So don't worry about capturing everything. As Deborah said, you'll be able to view the webinar afterwards to get more information. But to really look for a couple of things that's going to help you again, wherever you may be on this journey now. So as I said, we'll start out by talking about anticipatory grief. And the actual definition of anticipatory grief is on your slide. But what do I mean when I say anticipatory grief, anticipatory bereavement? 
It really is that feeling that we get when we look at our dog that was once a, once a puppy running around and now he's a little slower. Or maybe that black muzzle is a little grayer. Or it might be we that cat that we've had for the last 13 years that once was climbing on everything and knocking things down and now just struggles to get up on that windowsill to sit in that sun. Or unfortunately, it's that situation where we take our pet to the vet because we just know that there's something not right. And then we get that life-threatening terminal diagnosis. In all these situations, we notice that there's suddenly an internal acknowledgement that we can't ignore anymore. We realize that that time behind us is now longer than the time in front of us. And the feelings that we go through are often dread and fear and guilt and anger. And they're much like the feelings that we go through when we actually lose a cat. Here's something that I'll repeat several times during the webinar because I believe it's so important. While it's normal to have those feelings, I really encourage you to remember this, that your pets are still with you today. There is going to be plenty of time for grief when that time comes. But today, they're still here. Don't waste today worrying about tomorrow. Enjoy every moment that you have. And I know I say that it's a lot easier said than done, but it'll really mean so much for you in the long run. So while the information I'm going to share with you today is in part from my experience and training over the last 12 years, it also really comes because I'm a pet mom, um, living through and healing from both anticipatory grief and pet loss of my own beloved pets. So that's my beautiful torty girl, Callie, on the, on the right. I lost her about 10 years ago. And my beautiful chocolate point mazel tov is on the left. And it was really healing from Maz's loss just short of 15 years now that started this journey for me. Maz was with me for 17 years. He shared so much of life with me, including grad school, the end of a long-term relationship, and unfortunately, the loss of both my mom and dad in a short period. And I wasn't married. I had no children. And so he really was my first kid. He definitely was my best friend. He was the wisest teacher I've ever had. And I used to call him my furry soul. So when he was diagnosed with cancer at about age 17, I was determined to do everything possible. But after spending three months of surgery and chemo and trying different treatments, unfortunately, I lost him in his battle with lymphoma. But here's the thing. What I realize now is that not only did I lose Moz, but I also lost a lot of those three months before he passed. Why? Because I was so absorbed with trying to save him that I forgot he was right in front of me. I forgot the most important thing, taking the time to just spend with him and love him. So when Callie started getting older and started getting more serious signs of kidney disease, I was determined to do things differently, and I did. There wasn't as many hospitalizations, less medicines, and more time spent loving him. And when that time came, I had a vet come to the house because Callie hated going to the vet. Did I grieve less? Absolutely not. She was my girl. Did I feel better focusing on making her comfortable, making myself comfortable? Yes. And that did help my healing. My point in sharing this with you is that having this information can help in making a very difficult time a little bit more bearable. I'm going to start out by talking about some suggestions for dealing with your visits with the vet. And listen, getting a diagnosis of a life-threatening illness is so difficult. 
And there's that initial period where we're just trying to make sense of it all. It's almost like those old Charlie Brown movies on TV where they had that teacher that was talking and you just heard her saying, wow, 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 wow. Nothing really makes sense. Hearing those words is incredibly difficult. So I strongly recommend that when you have to go to the vet, and even today with COVID, sometimes we have to do the telephone consultation. Have a friend or family member with you there. There's a couple of reasons. First of all, it's nice to have the emotional support. But more importantly, though, again, when we get that difficult diagnosis, whether we think we're prepared for it or not, there's some level of denial or struggling to come to terms with the diagnosis. So having someone that can kind of be your recorder, hearing the information, asking questions, helping you absorb the information. I also recommend before the visit to write down any questions that you do have. And more importantly, make sure that before you leave, you have all the questions answered. Besides questions having to do with the diagnosis, I recommend questions like those on the slide. So when is the best time to reach you? Who should I contact if you're not available? What about if there's an emergency? What does this information do? It gives you a little bit more control of what a situation that feels very uncontrollable. And it makes it a little bit more comfortable. The items on this slide can be very difficult to think about. But boy, are they important and definitely something I wish I did for mine. And think about it, right? As we get older, even though we don't want to, we're often faced with thinking about things like life insurance, making a will, finding where is our final resting spot. It's very uncomfortable. We may not want to do it. But there is also some comfort when it's done, when we have our wishes in writing, so we know that our wishes are followed. So why not consider this with our pets, too? either right after we get that diagnosis or definitely before a critical situation occurs. And again, I say this from experience of a pet mom who didn't make those decisions and was faced with incredibly difficult decisions at a very emotional and critical time. The benefits are enormous. On here, you see something what to watch for. What do I mean by that? You may want to start thinking about what are a few of the changes in your pet that you'd have to see that would make you think that it, the end of life may be closer or may even be imminent. I've also listed a couple of tools you can use to help with that, and we're going to go over those in a bit. The point is, as difficult as these decisions are, the positive part is that once those decisions are made and written down, you put them away and you don't have to look at them every day until that time gets closer. It's just so much better than having to make decisions with end of life or afterlife at an emergency situation like I was faced with. I mentioned the quality of life scale. Quality of Life Scale was developed by Dr. Alice Villalobos. She is a world-renowned veterinary oncologist, incredibly compassionate vet. While she's since retired, her goal has always been to provide the best quality of life rather than quantity. And in my eyes, the beauty, the beauty of this Quality of Life Scale is that it allows pet parents to view their pet's quality of life objectively rather than emotionally. And we all know that can be very difficult not to be subjective and overly emotional. The quality of life scale has you look at your pet's quality of life on six criteria. You see them here. So 
Is your pet in pain? Are they eating okay? Are they drinking okay? Do they express joy or interest? Are they able to get around okay? And do they have more good days than bad days? And what you do is you go through each one of those. So zero is where they can't breathe or they're in a lot of pain. Ten is where, no, they're not. They're fine. They're, it doesn't look like they're in pain at all. You take all those numbers, you add them up. And I believe the number is about 45. If the total scale is like 45 or more, then it said that they have a decent quality of life. If it's under that, it means it may be time to start thinking about those end of life decisions and even euthanasia. It's a great tool to do with a family member or a friend because again, they're going to be more objective in their assessment. And I will tell you that this scale was really helpful for me in knowing when the time was getting closer and making plans for my beloved Kelly. And here's what I did. I put together my own Kelly's quality of life piece. A few months before Kelly passed, I started using the quality of life scale on a regular basis. First, I did it every couple of weeks, eventually every week. And toward the end, it was really every few days. The benefit for me is that I could keep track of how she was doing. It was like seeing proof of her decline. It helped me make decisions. And I could even share things with my vet. It really helped me stay out of the denial of her decline. And I have to tell you again, I want you to know it was not easy to do. But I felt I owed it to Callie. And I wanted to do better than I had with my beloved Maz in making him go through as much treatment and not knowing the information that I was learning. There are other decisions that need to be considered too. What I'm talking about here is what type of vet you want involved at the end. Do you want a hospice vet, an in-home vet, or would you rather prefer to bring your pet to a veterinary office where you know this vet and they've worked with you for many years? The important thing to keep in mind is remembering what brings the most comfort to your pet and peace for you. I'll tell you that what you want and what's best for your pet may not always be the best thing. The most important thing is to always do what's best for your pet, even if it's a little bit more difficult for you. Another thing to think about when that time comes is do you want to bury your pet? Where are you going to bury him? Have you visited the facility or do you know people who have used that facility or have you called them? Or would you prefer to cremate your beloved pet? And again, it's horrible decisions to have to think about, right? All I can tell you is trust me from my experience and other clients that I've dealt with. It's a lot easier to think about them ahead of time than in an emergency situation when your pet's in critical care and you have a vet tech after the euthanasia come in and say, what do you want to do now? Or, or, or what do you want to do in terms of aftercare? And you haven't even thought about it. You don't want to have to go through that. While all of this may seem opposite of the comment I made above, remembering that your pet is still with you and wanting to enjoy every moment, really it's not. Because if you could think about these things ahead of time, then again, you have those decisions made, you put it aside, you go on living and enjoying the time you do have with your beloved pet. And that's what's important. That's what I want to focus on now too, is helping you to do that. And there is another tool I'd like to share with you that speaks to end of life decisions in terms of reminders 
that can be sometimes hard to think about during this time. It's called The Pledge from the Heart, and I actually wrote it a couple of years after I lost Moz, and I had just started to do this work. I was really thinking about the lessons that I learned through this whole experience and losing him and what I wanted to share with others so they didn't have to go through some of what I had to go through. So I wrote this pledge from the part. I have it on the slide. I'm going to go through it with you. This is a resource. I'd be glad to send it to you. And again, I'll talk more about that at the end of the webinar. But the pledge from the heart really helps you to remember. To remember not to allow the treatment to become harder on you or the pet than the disease or age itself. To remember to stay in the moment and enjoy the days you have. To remember to put the pet's needs before your fear of losing them. To remember to keep track of the quality of life. To remember to stay strong enough to be by their side and make those decisions that have to be made. And then to honor their memory by taking the gifts that they've given you. It's all so important. So how else can we really begin to enjoy that time together? There's a few ideas here on this slide. It's really about working and thinking and bringing yourself back to today like we've talked about. So when you find yourself worrying about what's going to happen in the end, look in your pet's eye. And you know what you see? You see that all they care about is today and spending it with you. And that's what you need to do, too. Have those special adventures. I'm sure you've heard about people who have made pet bucket lists. Think about doing that. Take your pets on special rides or walks, or if they can't walk that good, get a carriage and let them sit in that. Get special treats for your cat or toys. Sit in the sun with them, brush them, and talk to them. Let them know what you're feeling. Even let them know you're scared. Let them know how much you love them. And let them know that you promise to make the best decisions for them. There are some more resources on this page. And again, you see things like in-home hospice vets. And what I mean here is thinking about possibly developing a relationship with a vet that can come and do home check to see how your pet's doing, so that you don't always have to bring them to a vet's office. There are also hospice organizations that will do in-person or sometimes telephone consultations with you. Bright Haven is a great source. There's another newer group now called Animal Hospice Group that'll have telephone conversations with you. And these are people have, who have been doing this work for many years. A super important point that I'm going to reinforce a couple of times is to also realize that you're not alone. And this is something that I wish I knew when I was trying to make those decisions for Moz. It would have made a huge difference to me if I had a professional like a pet loss specialist or a counselor who that I can talk to, someone who has that compassionate ear and heart to listen, to give you advice, to not judge you, but to walk alongside you. Thankfully today, there are counselors, there are pet loss support groups, and I will let you know that in the groups I do, we often have people who have not yet lost their pet, but want to be around people who understand. So I encourage you to seek them out. Take advantage of that support. Take advantage of the groups. We also have, there's pet loss chat rooms. I always recommend chat rooms that have trained specialists in them. Or even an individual session. Today, they even have an animal chaplain. 
The point is that you don't have to and you should not go through this alone. It's a very difficult time. So I happen to love this man. Um, his teachings are something that really mean a lot to me. And this saying is one I think is particularly important for this topic. And it says, in dealing with those who are undergoing great suffering, if you feel burnout setting in, if you feel demoralized and exhausted, it's best for the sake of everyone to withdraw and restore yourself. The point is to have a long-term perspective. And it's so true. Being an end-of-life caregiver can be exhausting physically, emotionally. And if you begin to burn out, you're not going to be doing your pet or yourself any good. So how do we take care of ourselves? so that we can take the best possible care of our path? Well, here's a few ideas, right? It's about getting enough sleep and eating enough. I know when Maz was sick, I spent so much time worrying about his sleep and his that he was eating enough that I'd often forget to eat myself or to sleep enough. And then I'd wonder why I couldn't get to work in the morning or why I was getting one cold after another. Try to do something pleasurable, either with your pet, like on a bucket list, or maybe even having lunch with a friend. And if you don't feel comfortable going out to lunch, let them come in and have lunch with them at your house. However, there is something that you may have heard about, which is respite care. And it's very often used in human hospice, but I think we can use it here too. And it means having someone come in to help you so that you can get out. You can get out to do errands. You can get out to have a lunch or dinner with your significant other or spouse. The point is to ask for and accept help. And remember that you are not alone. This here is a few more areas where you can look for support. Again, whether it be friends and family, finding those people who know your path, who know you and are there to support you. Getting written resources. There are a couple of books I know of that deal with anticipatory grief. And if you feel a need to learn more about the condition, disease your pet has, let me make a suggestion. Don't use Dr. Google. Dr. Google always gives us the worst, the worst case scenario. Talk to your vet. Ask them if there's any information they could provide for you. Ask them if there's any good articles or sites that you can go to to learn more about it. And then again, there's the support groups. There's counselors. There's animal chaplains. I know I have shared a lot of information here and not a lot of time, but here's my point. By never forgetting to enjoy today with your pet and remembering that they are with you today and that's all they really care about. While no, at the same time, you know you have those important decisions made. You make those decisions, you put them away. By remembering to take care of yourself and to ask for help and support. Not only is it going to help you get through, again, a very difficult time, but it's going to be more comfortable for your pet because when they see you more relaxed and comfortable, they're more relaxed and comfortable as well. So I'm going to take some time. We're going to answer some questions now. And Deborah, I'll let you handle that. Okay, sure. Um, a few questions were actually answered by Connie Starr. Do you know her? I assume she, she knows uh, her. Yes, Connie. Yes. Okay. Um, 
So for those of you who want a state-by-state -state guide to what's legal when you're burying um, your pet, uh, chat has a website that you can look at. And also, she explained that aquamation, aquamation. is alternative. What is it? Aqua. Aquamation. Okay. Is an alternative to cremation using water and chemicals, which is gentler on the environment. Do you have anything to add to that? Because a few people asked what that. Yeah. Is. So aquamation um, is more environmentally friendly. Um. I will tell you that not every state allows it. So you do have to check just like with burying your pet, you have to check to see if it's legal in your state. Um, I know when I was living in California, there were a couple of places and they did a really nice job. Um, the cremains come out differently um, and, and they process them differently and what you get is different a little bit different is what I've noticed I think it does sometimes take a little longer because it is that process that natural process and there are some people who are not comfortable with the idea of cremation and don't want to bury because maybe they don't know where they'll be and they want to be able to have something of their pet with them. And so in those cases, aquamation is definitely an option, but you want to check with your state again to be sure that it's allowed. Where can you check? I think if you look up, if you just even Google um, states that allow, aquamation it'll tell you there that's what i would do that's the best thing to do you may also want to talk to your vet they may be they will definitely know if it's something that's allowable in your state okay um one person mentioned that she prepared a will for her pet and gave something of his to all of her friends, family, and neighbors with pets. That's beautiful. What a beautiful idea that is. I'm sure that had to be very healing for you as well. Um, okay. Here's a, another comment. Um, I've heard that these in-home end-of-life services are very staff volunteer limited lately. So an in-home call needs to be planned sometimes weeks in advance. I don't want to take my dogs to the vet when the time comes, but I don't want to plan to put my dogs down weeks in advance either. Yeah, and so I would suggest this. I would suggest reaching out to, because I always suggest whoever you use in either case, you want to speak to the vet or the service. You want to make sure you feel comfortable. You want to ask any questions that you might have for them. So I would call them and ask about that. Almost every in-home vet that I have known, even before um, the pandemic um, will allow you if that day comes and you're not ready or something happens, you can change it. So you can schedule something for several weeks out and change it if you need to. I think they do ask for 24 hours notice. Um, okay. What special qualifications or training? do hospice vets have? Yeah, and, and I think there are programs that they go through. I mean, I think a lot of it is taught during veterinary school, but I think it's just <gasps> different certifications. I'm thinking of one organization I know that offers a hospice certification for vets who are already trained as regular vets. So they have to go to vet school but then they can go on 
just like picking a specialty. All right, this is, um, Patty says that uh, she's euthanized four dogs in consultation with their vets, but they decided to, uh, well, one of the dogs rallied twice when they took him to be euthanized. So she decided he needed to go in his own time at home and naturally. This decision was made in consultation with three vets who knew him well and helped us provide hospice care at home. She still has people, not his vets, tell her 15 years later that we put her, well, we put our needs first and let him go too long. What is the best response to those people? So, so let me address a couple of things here. Um, there is something that happens um, with both human hospice and also with um, animal hospice in that a dying soul, a dying body will rally at the end. So I'll give you one example where I had a friend's dog who was really struggling to get up and move around wasn't eating, and just didn't look very happy. So they made the appointment. They went in that day to the vet because the vet knew him really well. Um, and when they got out, when they got to the vet, the dog jumped out of the car and kind of strutted into the office. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Sometimes animals rally like that. There's there's two sides. So there's a medical explanation. There's a spiritual explanation. I'll just go with the spiritual one because that's the one I like better, which says that I think it's like the animal knows that finally they don't have to struggle anymore. There's not going to be any more pain, any more treatment. And there's a relief. And that happens with people too. Um, in terms of making a decision to have a pet go on its own. And it sounds like Addie did the right thing because I will tell you, you should never just decide, you know what, I'm just going to let them go on their own without really talking to hospice vets, regular vets, and having them work with you. Talking to that animal hospice group I talked about or Bright Haven. People think that pets just, you know, they go to sleep and it's, it's pain-free. That's not always what happens with a dying body. A dying body can go into seizures. A dying body, the lungs could fill up with fluid. And it could be very painful and very uncomfortable for both the pet and the pet parent, right? So if you want to make that decision, and again, it sounds like Addie did, um, I would definitely make sure that you're working closely with your vet, a hospice vet, that you talk to an organization about that. In terms of what to say to people, um, and we'll talk more about this in the pet loss section as well, but I will tell you that it's your decision and you really don't have to explain it to anybody. Um, I know you, you feel like you do, but I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, you know, this was a really difficult decision. It's not something I made lightly. And as I told you, I made it in working with vets who knew my dog and trusted me and my dog. And it's my decision. You, you weren't walking in my shoes. You couldn't possibly walk in my shoes. So I'm going to ask you to, to just trust me on this, that I know I made the right decision. And it's still difficult enough. And why would you want to make me go through this? Sometimes you kind of have to put people in their place. And again, we'll talk a lot more about that in the pet loss section. But People can be really cruel, not meaning to, 
but in the things they say and how they say them. And we need to take care of ourselves. I hope that helps. Probably be the last question for now, and then we'll get to the others later. Um, here it is. What do you do if you get up in the morning and find that your dog has died overnight? Yeah, and, and there again, it varies in different states, um, what you can do and what you want to do. Um, personally, you may want to spend some quiet time with them to allow yourself to say that proper so long before you do anything. The next step that I would do is I would probably call my vet before, um, before an aftercare facility. And the reason why is again, they generally have people they trust and know and a lot of times you may not. And so this way you at least know that your pet is going to a place that the vet trusts. So that's the two things I would do. Um, Patty and Jessica, you both have questions that I'm going to hold because they're probably more appropriate for after we talk about the death of, of your pet. Um, I've had already every experience that I have read about in chat. I've had dogs die overnight. I've had a dog who went too long. I've had dogs that we were taking to, to be euthanized and then brought back. So, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot here myself. Good. Um, Sandra, let's, uh, let's move on. Okay, great. Just give me one moment here. Okay, and there were some really good questions. And again, some of them actually I hope will be answered in this section as we talk about pet law. So we are gonna move from anticipatory grief to when that difficult time comes and we lose our beloved pet. As we move into this, I'm gonna say what I said earlier. There's truly not a lot you can do to prepare for the feelings of loss. We always think, oh, okay, I know this is gonna happen. I've been through it with so many pets before. Really, every single time we go through this, it's different. And so the best we can do, again, as I said in the anticipatory grief section, is to make the most of our time together and to also realize that support is available for us when that time does happen. So I want to start out talking about some truths about grief, especially pet loss, because part of what makes this so difficult is that we don't understand, or a lot of people don't understand grief and loss. And we hear things, we hear these misconceptions. Addie, you just gave an example, right? Where people are saying, Oh, you waited too long. You should have done this. You should have done that. And all it does is it makes it so much harder to handle. So the first truth I'm going to talk to you is about is that your feelings are real and they're valid because they're yours. They're in your mind. They're in your heart. And while the more you begin to heal, they're definitely going to change. They are your feelings, and you don't need to apologize to anyone for them. I always say that our society is not good at grief, and pet loss is truly a disenfranchised type of loss. What makes this loss so difficult is that so many people just don't understand those. Those of us who think of our pets as fur kids or soulmates, people may not have been raised with pets, they may not have pets, and so they think it's just a dog or it's just a cat. I always say, feel sorry for them. I can't even imagine going through my life without getting to know that incredible love. So it's so important to realize that your feelings are real, they're valid, just like your relationship is real and valid, and your love is real and valid. Think about it. 
if you were to look up a definition of love or grief, nowhere does it describe those emotions in terms of how many legs the pet that you, or the soul that has gone has, right? Love is love. Grief is grief. Please don't be embarrassed or feel you don't have a right to feel your feelings. You do. And both you and your pet deserve that. At the same time, while your grief is real and valid, it's also your own grief. You will never find two people, even in the same family, who will go through grief in the same way. Why? Well, first of all, they have different personalities. They also have different grief history. Some people may have never gone through a loss before. Others may have gone through a lot of losses. They also have different histories and relationships with the pet. It may be that you had a pet since it was a puppy and then you met somebody and they moved in with you and the pet was seven or eight. Clearly, your relationship is going to be different than theirs. The thing to remember is the same way we want others to respect us and our grief, we have to respect them and their grief. And this can be very difficult when you're dealing with a couple, a significant other, even a family, because people are going to heal in their own way and at their own time. So it's really about compromise. It's really about allowing the others to feel how they need and want to feel and not judging it. You may or may not have heard this, but it's so true. Grief really has no timeline. One of the most common questions that I get asked and we get asked in chat and in the groups is, how long is it going to take before I begin to feel better? And listen, I wish I could give my clients a pill or sprinkle some fairy dust to stop the pain. That's not how this works. This is your grief journey, and it's going to take the time that it takes. Some start to feel healing happen in a month or two. For others, it could take six to nine months. That's okay, too. What's important is that you don't give up, that you continue to take those baby steps. And in the beginning, there may be more steps back than forward. We always talk about the grief journey is full of potholes and U-turns, but don't give up. Keep working through the law, and slowly but surely, you are going to begin to heal. I also just want to quickly mention something with this as well. And that a lot of people, when they come to us, talk about, oh, I think I'm in the denial phase. I think I'm in the bargaining phase. There are no grief phases. What you're talking about is Elizabeth Cooper Ross, um, who wrote the stages of grief. Here's the thing. She wrote them for people who were dying, not for people who are dealing with grief. The good thing about those stages is that they help to frame some of what we're feeling. But there is no, oh, this is how you go through grief. You go from A to B to C to D. Grief is messy. There's no order to it at all. It goes back and forth and up and down and all over. So please remember that as you go through this too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the emotions of grief. And I really debated whether or not to put this slide in. But it's so important that I decided to do it. Why was I hesitant? because I will tell you that I can do a whole webinar on an hour and a half just talking about sadness and anger and guilt. So I do want to touch upon a few important things, though, because most of us will experience all of these emotions at some point in our journey toward healing. While sadness is the most accepted and it's the feeling that most people say they Feel. When it comes to anger and guilt, it gets a lot more complicated. 
in terms of anger, it's often said that anger is really just fear and sadness combined. And when we're grieving, it's easy to see that, right? But for many, it's easier to feel angry, whether it's valid or not, than sadness. Sadness is exhausting. Sadness is hard. But society accepts anger more than sadness. People feel very uncomfortable seeing people crying. But with anger, that they can relate to. So if you were going to say to somebody, I'm so darn angry at that dog walker, he should have done this or that, people will be like, yeah, you should put a bad review on Yelp. Yeah, I agree. But if you start crying in front of them, if you tell them you feel like you just can't get up and you don't think it's going to get any better, the majority of people are very uncomfortable. They don't know what to say. So anger is the easier emotion to deal with for you sometimes and definitely for them. With the guilt, I'll be honest. In the 12 years I've been doing this, I would say that 98% of my clients, me included, have felt guilt over something. What do we feel guilt over? Pretty much everything. Doing too much, not doing enough, waiting too long, not waiting long enough, not spending enough time with the past, wondering if we euthanize them too soon. So many people question if they made the right decision at the right time, but there's actually a term for it, and it's called euthanasia remorse. It's as if when we bring these pets into our lives, we also get an invisible cape that has a big S on it for Superman or Superwoman. And it's like we're supposed to know it all, and we're supposed to do it all perfectly. But the truth is, we don't know it all. And we can't control everything. We can't control aging. We can't control cancer. We can't control kidney disease. In truth, the best we can do is make the best decisions we can at the moment. And we make them move up. And who can blame us for that? So please don't forget that. And don't forget that it's very normal to have feelings of sadness, but also feelings of anger and guilt as well. So how do we begin to cope with the sadness then, the anger, the guilt? That's what we're going to talk about next. The first thing and perhaps the most important thing is to allow yourself to grieve. How many of you have heard from a friend, a family member, a coworker? Don't cry. It's going to get better. Try not to feel so bad. You've been grieving a really long time, don't you think? It's time you get over it. In general, as I said, people are very uncomfortable with grief and sadness. And that's what makes it hard for us. One of the most important things to remember with pet loss is this. There's no way around grief. It really is only through. What does that mean? It means that you have to feel the pain. It means that you have to shed the tears. Then it means that you have to work your way through the grief. As I said before, your feelings are real. They're valid. It's normal. It's understandable. It's necessary to grieve, to mourn, and to take the time to work your way through the grief. When we grieve, we honor our love. We honor our loss. It's part of healing. I cannot stress enough the importance of self-care. On our website, on the homepage, we have this information here, this BREATHE acronym. We created it because we wanted to emphasize the importance of self-care. Through our beloved pet's life, 
we did everything we could to make sure that they were happy and healthy and well taken care of. It's not unusual for us, again, to hear from my clients. They'll talk about how they would get up in the middle of the night three times to give their pets the medication, to give them more water, to let them out. We are amazing caregivers, just not so much of ourselves. But now it is that time. Now it's our job to take care of ourselves. And in doing that, we continue to honor the legacy of our beloved past. Because you know what? We know one thing we know for sure is that they would want us to be well and healthy and happy. And it is a scientific fact that grief can suppress our immune system. And the last thing we need right now is to get sick on top of grieving. That's why I created that. Because when it gets overwhelming, it's important just to breathe. It's important to rest. Grief is exhausting. To eat well and exercise. To ask for help. To honor your heart and your mind and your body and your relationship with your pet. And to know that the love you feel, that goes on forever. So I often talk about how when we go through this grief, it's like we're walking around in a fog. A lot of us in this field call it the grief fog. Nothing seems to make sense. It can be really hard to remember to even take care of our most essential needs, to brush our teeth and to shower. I've had people tell me, and I remember feeling like this, home just doesn't feel like home. I feel like I've lost an arm or a leg, a big part of me. At the same time, I can't stress enough the importance of making the best decisions we can for ourselves. What do I mean about with this? I'm really talking about the best decision when it comes to who we want to be around. Finding those that we know can understand our grief and support us. And part of that is sometimes we learn as we go, right? Sometimes we share something with a friend or family member. And again, they say something really inappropriate. That's those times just for a while to limit our conversations and our time with them. To not be vulnerable with people that just don't get it. The same goes with deciding what you do and don't want to do. And while there may not be a lot of leeway with work, although I know with the pandemic, some of us are still working at home, we can still make careful decisions about who we want to be with, where we want to be, if we even want to go out socially, when we feel it's appropriate for us. We make these decisions by staying mindful, staying in the moment when it comes to deciding again who we want to be with, where we want to be, going back and asking ourselves, how is this going to make me feel? That really leads nicely to this slide. And again, I cannot stress enough, and I know I've said it before, I'm going to say it again and probably at least one other time after that, the importance of getting support, of finding a community to work through your grief with. Pat Loss Partners offers two virtual support groups each week, and I am so proud of how compassionate and supportive the members in the group are. We have people joining us from all over the country. We also offer two pet loss chat rooms a week. Similar to the group, there's so much support and compassion. So if you're not comfortable in a virtual situation, the chat rooms are online. And we have wonderful, trained, compassionate, caring pet loss specialists that are there to support and guide you too. 
you may need to find a pet loss specialist to work individually with. I do work with people all over the country, either virtually, by telephone. You know, I, I can't tell you how important to me in healing from Moz's loss. It was when I finally found a support group and I lost them in 2007. And even living in a place like LA, there was one group that I found and it was about half an hour away. But you know what? When I found it, I went every single week because it was people that got it. And I needed that so much. And there are many more options out there today than when I was grieving. The most important thing is that whether or not you work with our organization or another organization, to remember that you don't have to go through it alone. Something that has helped so many of us in healing from this loss is finding ways to memorialize our beloved past. And I wanted to share a little bit both about the benefits of finding ways to memorialize a pet and then to give you some ideas that you may want to consider. One of the greatest benefits in finding ways to memorialize your pet is that it really helps to remember the good times that we shared with our pet. And listen, at first, those memories will smile at the same time as a tear is rolling down our cheek. And the more we give ourselves that time to heal, the more those memories will bring us comfort and warmth to our heart. The more we're able to hold and share those memories, the more we're able to reconcile our grief. It also helps to maintain our relationship with our beloved pet. We can have things around that, again, it'll make us feel closer to them. I often get asked, is it okay to keep their bed out, their water bowl out? Is it okay to have so many pictures out? Absolutely. Again, this is your grief. And if it's bringing comfort to you, if you need to have a million pictures out, have them out. If you can't have any pictures out yet, that's okay too. Another benefit of finding ways to memorialize our past is it allows us to express and embrace our pain. And some of you may not look at expressing and embracing pain as a benefit, but it is. Memorializing pets can make us cry, but that's a good thing. Tears are a good thing. There's even been some people who have written about how when we grieve, it builds up toxins in our body. And that by allowing our tears to come out, it releases some of those toxins. Whether or not we want the pain to come out through our words or the tears to flow, they are inside of us. So allowing those tears, allowing those emotions and words to have an outlet, to have a relief, in the long run, it is going to make us feel better. And it's also going to lessen the intensity of the feeling. When we memorialize our pet, it also encourages us to share those sweet memories with our friends and family. We may want to show them the honor objects we've created or have them join in in a memorial service. Sharing with others gives us the opportunity to show others the love we have for our pet. And is there anything more heartwarming than hearing stories from others about your pet or the relationship they had with your pet? Stories from others can bring back a really lovely memory that may have slipped from your mind, but now you get to keep it in your heart forever. And most importantly, it helps us remember that our beloved pets are just a memory away. And again, I know, especially in the beginning, it's not what we want. It's not enough. The memories are not enough. But the more we're able to heal, the more comforting it can really become. 
Now, in terms of options for memorializing past, there is a wide variety of very effective ways to honor our cherished past. An added benefit is that many of them are really inexpensive and quite easy to do. When choosing how you're going to memorialize your pet, you're going to want to find what means the most to you and what means the most to the relationship that you shared with your pet. There's no wrong or right way to memorialize a pet. It's what feels right in your heart. So to remember your pet, you may like to have a plaque placed at a special place that you shared with the pet. If the pet lost its life in a certain area, you may want to erect some type of memorial area, memorial in that area. Some vet offices, some dog parks have memorial walls or walkways where you can actually buy an engraved brick or stone. Some organizations like Best Friends have Angel's Breath, which is amazing. You can actually see it on YouTube or Google it. And you get to purchase a wind chime to memorialize your pet. If you're lucky enough, you can even go to their sanctuary to see your chime. Because they'll send you something letting you know where it is. They'll also send you a photo of the wind chime that you purchased. Some people like to keep a bit of their pet with them by putting a small amount of the cremains into jewelry. The cost of those depends on the materials that are used. Cremains can also be infused into glass or vases or sun caps. Personalized urns are also available in lots of different shapes and designs. You know, you can talk to your aftercare facility. Normally, they will have a good variety of things that you can choose from. But today, I mean, I, I even saw something on Etsy. So again, and there's different companies that specialize in this as well. You may want to remember your pet by letting your creative juices flow. It can be incredibly healing to find a creative outlet for the grief. Some people find it in writing a song or a poem or a story. I've actually had a couple of clients who wrote children's books about their pets so they could share their pets with others. Some do photography or painting or make a scrapbook outlining their lives with their beloved pets. If you want to do a painting of your pet and you don't have that talent like me, there are many artists that will work from photographs to create a special masterpiece just for you. You can also find lots of options on Etsy with that. If you want to go somewhere in between, there are these companies who will transform a photograph into a paint by number kit, and then you can paint it. All you need to do is Google photo into paint by number, and you should have a different companies that will come up. One of the best ways to honor a pet is to make a donation of supplies or money in the pet's name to a favorite pet charity. You may want to even help out the organization where you got your pet from. I don't know of any nonprofit pet organization that don't need money or supply. You might choose a charity that's related to the pet you want. Selecting items like pet food or blankets or beds or even special treats or comfort items that your pet loves. And of course, a cash contribution is always welcome. Again, I think all nonprofits are very thankful for any cash contributions. You may also want to plant a memorial tree. Many of our clients have found a lot of comfort doing something related to nature. It may mean setting up a memorial garden in your backyard. It can be extremely healing to watch plants grow 
And some clients choose to put a part of the cremains in the garden. If you don't own a home, you can do something similar just on a smaller scale. Maybe you use an inside or balcony plant. You may also want to go to a favorite spot that you shared with your pet and plant a tree or bush. And then maybe when you're really missing them, you go and visit them and spend some time there. This is one of my favorites, I'll admit. Um, a lot of my clients have also done this in a variety of ways. And I often say, you know, we have funerals for people. Why not for pets? I mean, that's how we started getting the field of animal shelter. And one good thing about a memorial service is that the variations are endless when it comes to planning it. Some clients like to have a lot of friends and family join them. Others choose smaller, more intimate settings. Some have very structured events on music and others just like going with the flow. The memory, the memorials can be held in whatever environment is most comfortable for you. We've had clients travel to different places and some use their backyard. The most important thing is that the location have meaning for you. There are also like I said, animal chaplains that will help you plan and create and facilitate your pet memorial service. I will tell you that when Moz died, I did have a memorial service at a park with about five or six of our friends. I had created a memorial book with pictures and poems, and everybody had a chance to read a poem and share a memory. And then we played some Marley songs because Moz and I are big Marley fans. And then we released the balloon. And this was way before it was, they talked about don't release balloons, it's bad for the environment. But it was really healing for me and the others there too. I often, my friends will often bring it up and how much they enjoyed. If you don't want to do a memorial, but you want to find a way to honor your pet, maybe you don't have the means or you don't want to do it, in person, more and more sites are becoming available for pet parents to place a memorial on them. Some may charge a fee. Some do have restrictions on what can be posted. But some, like critters.com or gratefulness.org, allow you to post a free memorial or light a virtual candle. And that can be very therapeutic. There are also a number of pet loss sites on Facebook where people share their stories about their pets who have passed. But you can even use your own Facebook page and post a memorial form, share pictures, share stories. This may be difficult in the beginning, but at some point you may decide that you're ready to get back into the animal community. And what better way than maybe even helping out the rescue where you got your pet from or finding a similar rescue of a similar breed? These are just some of the ideas where, you, you know, you give back time. Maybe it's you're cleaning out cages or walking dogs or doing some advertising for them. Again, almost every animal shelter and rescue could really use support as well as donation. So we've given you a lot to think about in terms of different ways to honor your pet and hopefully some different coping strategies. Hopefully I've helped to normalize some of this grief as well. But before I wrap up, there's a couple of points that always come up when I talk to people in different settings or, or speaking events. And one of them is when to consider getting another pet. And so I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time on that. And just like everybody heals in their own time, there's no right or wrong timeline, although I do suggest strongly that you try to wait at least two to three months. Why? Again, we talk about that grief fall, right? That we're not really thinking clearly 
when this grief is new. And by giving yourself the time to work through the grief, it allows you to think about when and how. Additionally, if there's other people in the house, so you want to think about it. So here's some questions to ask. And I think all of them are equally important. Am I emotionally ready? I put a lot of weight on this one. And whenever anybody asks me, how do I know if I'm ready to get another pet? I ask them to ask themselves this question. Why are you getting another pet? And if the answer is, I'm lonely, I feel so sad, my other dog doesn't seem the same, I, that's not really a good reason. Because what you're doing is you want to bring a pet in with a job, and that job is to make you or your other pet feel better. That's not fair for them, especially if they've been in a shelter or a rescue to now bring them into a home with a job to do. But if the answer is, you know, I just feel like I've worked through the grief and I feel like I can open up my heart again, that's a really good reason. You also want to ask yourself, are you financially ready? Pets are expensive, especially as they get older. You may want to give yourself a little bit of time to recoup before you think about doing it. You want to talk to other family members and make sure they're ready. I always suggest that you wait or give more credence to the person who's having a harder time. But you also speak about time. You want to make sure you have the time. Pets are a lot of work, whether you get them as puppies or you get them as seniors. You want to make sure you have the time. The woman who started Pet Loss Partners with me, she waited seven years after her dog died. Why? Because she was a little older. Her husband was even older than that. And they wanted to travel for a while. They didn't want to be tied down. So they traveled. And then they, as when they realized they weren't going to do as much travel, they started looking around. You also want to consider the existing pet. How are they going to feel? They need time to heal too, right? Maybe they need time to be the number one if the other pet was the main, got most of the attention, put it that way. So all these are questions to think about. And again, I just want you to remember you're not alone in all this. You shouldn't have to go. Even if you don't want to go to a group or a chat or talk to a, a pet loss specialist individually, there are books out there. There are webinars like these. So I would recommend if you get a book, make sure it's written by someone who's trained in the profession. They're really going to give you the best help and the best advice. But I always say, I always tell people, try it once. Go to one group, one chat, have one session, just to get your bearings, just to get your feet back under you. And then if it's something that really fits with your lifestyle and you find really helpful, maybe you'll want to consider going more. But never, ever feel like you have to go through this alone especially in these days, you really don't. I'm going to end with probably my most favorite quote, and it's written by Susan Clothier, and I think so many of us could relate to it, and it's this. There is a cycle of love and death that shapes the lives of those who choose to travel in the company of animals. It is a cycle unlike any other. To those who have never lived through its turnings or walked its rocky path, our willingness to give our hearts with full knowledge that they'll be broken seems incomprehensible. Only we know how small a price we pay for what we receive. Our grief, no matter how powerful it may be, is an insufficient measure of the joy that we've been given. And I think every one of us 
would agree with that. So I'm going to go ahead and open it back up to questions. Um, as we do the questions, I'm going to go to the slide, which will share how to reach me, how to sign up for the groups or the chat. Um, how to get some of the resources that we talked about. And I think I mentioned it earlier on, but for the attendees of this webinar, I am offering a 20% discount off of a private session. All you need to do is send me an email to this email address, sandy at patlosspartners.org, and I will give you the details for that. Um, that is, I have two telephone numbers there. Feel free to reach out and call with emails and with calls, especially these days. Please give me 24 to 48 hours before I get back to you. Some, it may not take that long, but it may take that long. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and open it up, Deborah, if you want to, to the questions. Okay, um, before we even start with questions, this is the most helpful chat I've ever seen. Everyone is giving each other terrific advice, and I really applaud you all for knowing as much as you do and being willing to share it. Um, okay, one question is, is there a more humane way to end the life of our pets it doesn't include injecting them with a seizure medication. With a seizure medication. I, I don't think it's a seizure medication. I think what you're talking, there are times, let me say this, that a animal may go into a seizure. I think it's very rare. What they do is they give a sedative to, that generally calms the pet down. I will let you know I am not a vet, but so I, I can't give the specific details for that, but it's not specifically a seizure medication. Yeah, I, I've never seen any of my, well, seen. I've never heard about any of my dogs going into a seizure if they were being put down. Yeah. But, um, okay. Uh, this is a comment that I want to read because I want it to be on the, uh, the video. To those asking about aquamation, I've looked into it in depth. And with aquamation, the chemicals and whatever is from your pet flesh, blood, hair goes into our sewage system during the process. The bones are left over. So I think it's more with what you're comfortable with. Fire cremation, they've been doing since the beginning of time. To me, it's more organic because nothing um, touches its point. Oh, because nothing is toxic. Um, it's fire and your pet, so there are no chemicals in the air. It's my pet going up to heaven. That's the way I like to think of it. Aqua is new and is very chemical heavy. And except for bones, the rest goes into the sewage system. Is that how you understand it too, Sandra? And again, I don't know the specific details of it, I'll be honest. But again, I think it's very... Like you said, it's what makes you comfortable, and that's what we have to do. I think it's important, and thank you, Deborah, for getting that information and sharing it. I think it's important to do whatever makes us feel more comfortable. There's no right or wrong with that. That was someone in chat, not me. Um, no, I know. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any advice for somebody processing grief for a sudden, unexpected death? Um, Patty says it's been almost two years and she still feels like it was yesterday. Holy yeah. Shit. And, and, and so I will tell you that there are some times, unfortunately, where 
there's a death that's very traumatic. Um, when that happens, we can start to experience symptoms of or symptoms like PTSD. And many of you have heard about PTSD through um, our war veterans coming back and they see really horrible things in war and they're not able to let go of those memories. So it starts interfering with their lives, with their ability to socialize or work. And those, those memories can stay with us. What I recommend, and if you haven't um, talked to a pet loss specialist, I would really recommend that you first start out that way. I do not recommend a group if it is a trauma because I think you need more one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, secondly, though, you may need to work with a pet loss specialist in, conjunct in conjunction with an EMDR therapist. And EMDR um, stands for, and I always, it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprogramming. And it's used a lot in PTSD work. I can tell you that I have had several clients who have had really traumatic losses. And I work with them. I send them to an EMDR specialist. They can still keep working with me. And eventually, a couple of them started going to the group. And that was really helpful. But we really need to get through that part that you're caught on. So my suggestion number one is to work with a trained pet loss specialist and even to mention to them if they have any recommendations for EMDR specialists. Um, Carrie, to clarify the question about seizure medication, um, she wrote they may use phenobarbital as the sedative in anesthesia and euthanasia. This is used in pets with seizures, but it is being used as a sedative in this scenario. Um, yeah, and again, I, I don't have that veterinary knowledge, so it's really hard for me to, com you know, to comment specifically about that. What I will say is that in 95% of the cases that I've seen, either with myself or with my clients. Euthanasia is very, very peaceful. Um, they do give them a sedative, which calms them down, and then another injection, which slows their heart and eventually stops their heart. But it's nothing traumatic. And again, I'd even say in 95% of the cases that I've seen over the last 12 years. Someone else suggested that if you have leftover medications after the loss of your pet, you could donate them to your local shelter. Um, your pet's meds may save another pet's life. Yes, and I do believe it depends if they are opened or not or how old they are. So um, some rescues will not take them if they've been opened or depending on the date. But absolutely, it's a great idea. What a great way to honor your pet's legacy. Um, okay, these are getting hard to read. <laughs> um, okay. Danielle's dog has terminal cancer, and she's considering throwing a celebration of life party for any friends or family who uh, want to say goodbye. That's as much as I can get through that comment. Okay. And, <laughs> and you know what? And is it Danielle who said that? Yeah. Okay. And Danielle, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way to allow your pet to see people who have meant a lot to them and, and to allow people to say goodbye. Again, choose carefully those people you invite 
right? And realize too that people sometimes say some really insensitive things. They don't mean to. It's not like they're purposely trying to hurt you, but it may happen. So just be aware of that. Um, and then there's someone else who on the birthdays of her pets um, who have died, she gives a donation in their names to organizations um, and the veterinary teaching hospital they were treated at. Yeah, that again, that's a beautiful way, right? I actually have a client whose pet died on the first of the month. And so on the first of every month, they give a donation and they've been doing it for about a year. Um, when you have a pet with long-term health problems, so much of your day's rhythm revolves around their care. How do you deal with those constant reminders that they aren't there? Yep, and, and that's very difficult, right? You know, I, I almost say sometimes it's like, like an emotional shock, like a whiplash, an emotional whiplash. Like, wait, what just happened? My whole life was based on taking care of them. And it's not something that we can just fix like that. It's that process. It's that process of, working through the grief, right? So it may be starting to focus and say, in my pet's honor, I'm going to start doing things for me. So I've always wanted to take a yoga class. One day a week, I'm going to start taking a yoga class. Um, I'm going to look for a pet loss support group. And every time you do something, for you, and you can even tell people, I'm doing this in honor of Fluffy because I know Fluffy would want me to be okay. In terms of, and it's something that we have on our coping strategies handout, in terms of the memories being in your house, I will often say that it can be very helpful to kind of change things around a bit. And I'll give you an example. So when Maz died, I was living in a small one bedroom apartment. And obviously, I was doing a very different kind of work. And I work late into the evening sometimes and come home and feed the cats and then grab a lean cuisine and a snack table and sit on the couch, eating the lean cuisine. And invariably, Maz would come up and sit on the arm of the couch and he would get all the chicken or fish and I would eat all the vegetables and noodles. So when I first lost him, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to sit. I didn't know where to eat. Everything hurt. So the woman who led the group that I went to suggested, don't eat watching TV sitting on the couch. Make yourself sit at the table. And, eat. and I never, ever did that. And so it was like it, it broke that connection because that wasn't something I did when Maz was there. So that did help me. Another thing was I would always watch TV in bed and we watch a show together and fall asleep in the bedroom. I took the TV out of the bedroom because I didn't want to do that same thing. It's like that brain connection where it's like, oh yeah, I always used to do that. Well, if you change it up a bit. I mean, I even took it to extreme. I'll, I'll tell you that I had a couple of my neighbors come up and actually change the position of the furniture in my apartment. And you may say, I, I don't see how that can help. Trust me, it does. By breaking those routines that we did with them, it takes away a little bit of the pain. So I would also suggest that. Um, people mention guilt over various things, over not doing more to save their dog, over 
uh, letting their dog go too long, um, over not talking to them or touching them when they were um, being euthanized. Um, no matter what your decision was, people are feeling guilt about it. Um, and a few people wanted to know if um, you think the dog can sense that they're there. Can sense that they're there at the end? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. When I have Maz euthanized, and he actually did have seizures on the way to the vet. And so when they sedated him, I asked, and I said, do you think he can hear me? Do you think he knows that I'm there? And she said, I'll never forget the vet said this. She said, medically, I can't guarantee it, but do I feel like he knows you're holding him? Do I feel like he knows you're touching him? Do I feel like he could sense your voice? Yes, I do feel that way. And I do think that. And again, I'm going to say this because my clients have said it to me. And it goes back to that euthanasia remorse, right? I have had clients say to me, I feel like I killed my dog or my cat. And I always say to them, no, you didn't. You just ended the suffering. It was the cancer that was killing them. If you didn't euthanize them, they would die a painful death due to that cancer. It was the kidney disease. Or, or it was not being able to do anything. They were just laying there. So you ended that suffering. You know, I, I always say, right, our pets teach us about unconditional love. They give us the, such unconditional love and isn't in a way allowing our pets to be euthanized our way of giving back that unconditional love because we know that we're ending their suffering, but we also know ours begin because we don't have them physically with us. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I, I think you've probably, with that answer, answered a few of these. Like, you know, will we ever forgive ourselves for not doing enough or, or for putting the, the pet down or? Yeah, and again, let me just say that that's where taking the time to work through the grief, that's how you begin to forgive yourself. You know, it's about, you may even want to write a letter to your pet and say, I'm sorry, I feel like I did this. I wish I had done that. What can be harder, but it's very healing, is to write a letter from your pet to you. What do you think they would want you to know? You know, so, but again, that's where the work of grief begins, right? And it does. That's why we call it the grief work. It takes work. There's that horrible saying, time heals. No, it doesn't. Time's just another day. What allows us to heal is when we dive in, as painful as it may be, and take the steps, do the work to heal, go to the groups, go to the chats, have a session, read a book, do the writing, talk to your pet, memorialize your pet. It takes work, but it does happen. Trust me, look at, I'll be honest, when I lost Mog, I didn't get out of bed for two weeks. I almost lost my job, and I wound up seeing a psychiatrist and getting on antidepressant medications so I could go to work. That helped in terms of lessening the intensity of those feelings. But as I said, I went to that group every week. Anything she said to do, you know, I, I joke around and I say, if she had said, you have to stand on your head for two hours a day, I would have done it. It's not easy or fast, but if you take the time to do the work, you will begin to heal. And you both deserve that. Um, 
can you talk a little more about how our relationship changes or evolves with our pets who have passed away? Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not a big quote person, but the one pet, the one quote that really meant a lot to me is this one. And it's that death doesn't end a relationship. It just changes it. And I think part of it too is the work that we do as well. And I always say everybody is entitled to their own feelings. Some people believe in an afterlife, others don't. If it works for you, if it makes it you feel better, that's all that matters. But I know for me, I mean, I'm sitting in front of you because of mom. And every time I help a person, I always say, thank you, Ma. You know, when I look at the website, Ma's picture is up there. It's the relationship we want to create through talking to them, whether it be talk or prayer, whatever feels more comfortable for you. If you don't believe in an afterlife, then it's the memories in your heart. You know, I, I often will talk to people who are atheist or agnostic. And I'll say this to them, which is, do you believe that a soul has energy, right? Or, or that we're made up of energy? And a lot of times they'll say, yeah. Okay, so then energy never dies, right? It just goes to some other place. So you may want to look at it like that. There are some very good books um, on the afterlife. Again, if you if you write to me, I'll be in on this slide here. I'll send you the coping strategies and also the pet loss bibliography. So feel free to send me an email. But there's some very good books, very healing books that have helped my clients um, in dealing with the afterlife. But it is the work we put into it, whether we want to write to them, to talk to them, things like that to honor them in some way. I've had a couple clients start their own rescue, honor their legacy in that way. Okay, um, Terry mentioned that on Pause and Rewards um, on their podcast, Marissa Martino read the letter that she wrote to her dog, Sully. And it is episode 45, pauseandrewards.com for anyone who wants to read that. Um, yeah, and again, writing a letter, I think it's very personal. Um, and that's neat that you get to, to read that one. I would encourage you to think about writing your own. Again, there's no right or wrong. It's for you and it's for your pet. And this just came up uh, twice because I, I guess we didn't cover it yet. Um, fear of forgetting the little things about my pet bothers me a lot. Yeah. And I will tell you what I did that really helped me is I created a memory list. So what I did was I took a piece of paper. I put it in my car. I put one at work, I put one on my end table, one on my dining room table, one in the bathroom. And every time I remembered some little funny thing, I'd write it down. And it is so comforting for me. I still have it for Callie and for Moss. And when I'm really missing them, I'll take them and I'll grab those papers and I'll look at them and laugh and sometimes cry. But definitely my suggestion is this. You don't want to put the pressure on yourself of writing down everything at once. So put it in different places and leave it there for a few weeks. Thank you so much, Sandra. This was really great. Good. Good. I'm glad. And again, um, for anybody who's here and is interested in a private session, you will get 20% discount. If you're interested in the support groups or chat rooms, please feel free to email me at that address. If you want 
the pledge from the heart or the coping strategies or the breathe reminders, feel free to email me as well. And just know that I'm here, here to support you however I can. Again, you're not reading the comments, but everyone no. is thanking you very much. So. You are most welcome. You know, I again, I do it for Moz. I remember how difficult it was. And I hope you just you just get hope that healing's possible, whether you're anticipating a loss or have gone through a loss, that healing is possible. And again, most importantly, you don't have to do it alone. Okay, thanks everyone. And thank you, Sandra, again. Thanks.